Welcome in. This is Erin Trafford. You are listening to episode 11 of season one of the fourth draft. Thank you so much for making this part of your listening day, your habits. This is the show where I don't hold back on where I think things are going in the media, new media and digital industries. It's kind of the culmination of all of my angst, frustration and anger. (laughs) So trust me when I say I really appreciate you hanging in and listening and sending all your comments. I get a lot of DMs on Instagram about this show, which is why I've decided to now start doing some of my recordings as lives on Instagram because I feel like my Instagram people really want to hang out. If you're not following me on Instagram, I'm at its.aarontrafford. All right, so what I want to talk about today, this is the second to last episode of season one, and there's been this lingering question for me that I haven't actually addressed yet on the show, and it's one that kicked off 2023 for me with new energy, new resolve, new research, really what it's the question that fueled the entire year for me uh, as a professional, as a leader, as a CEO, and now as a two-time founder. So the question that we are going to unpack right now is why do podcast networks not work? Why don't they work? And I'll give you a little bit of background on this. This is the question that popped into my inbox in January um, from a longtime friend and colleague, Scott Clark of Clark Communications up in North Bay, Ontario. And I'll give you a tiny, tiny little bit of history. North Bay is where I ostensibly began my career in 2006. I was part of a team that went into that city. It's about, you know, the actual city is about 70,000 people population wise. The broadcast catchment area is upwards of 150,000. In some cases, it's a quarter million. So it's not, it's, it's considered a small market, but it's not small. Um, I had just graduated grad school and got a call from the, the broadcast network um, and they were growing and they were buying up licenses and frequencies and they were going to launch a brand new station in the business we say flip a switch (laughs) on a new station in North Bay. And I said, sign me up. This is something I want to experience. I want to build something from the ground up. I don't just want to like take someone else's job and move in and try to make it my own, really move in and make it my own. So in 2006, we went up there, it was a very small team, a very small office, and we flipped a switch and we turned on a radio station. And I met a lot of incredible people along that journey. Uh, I was there for about two and a half years and Scott was one of them and we stayed in touch over the years and he has an extremely successful uh, marketing agency up in North Bay, Uh, builds software, he does digital marketing, he does lead generation, he does event management, like he's just got this beautiful team and this great company. So he's been following along with what I have been doing over on Story Studio Network and before that with my career in blogging. And so I was really excited when I got this email from him and it was like, Hey, Aaron, listen, like, I love what you're doing. This is phenomenal. I have a question for you that I can't answer. Uh, I've posed it to my team and we can't figure it out. And he said, why do podcast networks fail? Why don't they work? And I didn't answer him in the email. (laughs) I said, Scott, great to hear from you. Can we please, let's let's hop on a call and chat this through because I don't think I can get this out in just an email. So we set up a time to connect and had a great conversation about 90 minutes. We just, you know, energetically aligned, realigned, I should say, because we've known each other for 18 plus years now. And, you know, he had built the studio in his offices. They had sunk some money into it. They really wanted to get into podcasting. And he kept, you know, hesitating because all of the data out there shows that podcast networks actually don't work. And I said, you're right. They don't work. And he said, but don't you have a network? And I said, I do. But there's always a but, guys, with me. There's always a but. I, I do all of my research and then make sure that there is strategy over top. So I am going to share with you today a bit of a summary of how I explained myself and my thought process to Scott and how that resulted in the formation of the Echo Podcast Network. Because 
I say they don't work. They do work. But what most people think of as a podcast network is where the flaw is. That's where the fly is in the ointment. Okay. So let's peel this back and look at this question. And, and I, I, I'm going to really <laughs> dissect this. So I don't know if this episode is probably going to be a little longer than normal, but that's okay. That's okay. So the first question I need to ask is what is the purpose of a network? What is the purpose of a network? And I'm specifically talking about a media network right now. Okay. And I'll use a bit of Socratic method with us here. Is the purpose of a network to accumulate an audience? You could say yes, right? The purpose of a network is to gather more people in a meaningful way as an audience metric. Okay. But on the flip side of that, there's another question there to be asked, which is, is the purpose of the network to sell at scale to advertisers? And the answer to that question can also be yes. It actually should also be yes. So you've got yeses on both sides of this coin. The challenge comes, however, because each of those objectives, which is accumulating an audience at scale and or selling at scale to advertisers, requires in and of itself a very specific growth strategy and they don't necessarily align. They don't necessarily align. You need, I'm going to break this into the ingredients you need to make all of this work so that you really start to understand the challenges that Canadian media is facing right now. In order to make any of this work, you need content, obviously, right? I call that, you got, you, you got to put the filling in the pie, okay? So you need content. You need an audience. Otherwise, you're just talking into the abyss. And I'm going to use the term advertiser. And when I use the term advertiser, what I really mean there is it's interchangeable with revenue, right? You need fuel for the business. And the fuel comes in the form of money. It comes in the form of funds. So you need content, you need audience, and you need advertisers at scale in order to make a network any kind of network, whether it's a podcast network, a radio network, a television network. Hey, I hate to break it to you. I've worked for all three of those. <laughs> okay. You need content audience and advertisers at scale to make any network truly, truly work and be sustainable. So let's look at what's happening in the Canadian market right now. Okay. Because you're saying, well, there's tons of networks and I bet you're going to say, look at the CBC. Don't even get me started. Don't even get me started on the CBC podcast network. I have, I'm, I think I might do an entire bonus episode that only goes out to friends and family because I might say lots of sweary words about what's going on with the CBC podcast network. They do great work. <laughs> I, I am definitely a hypocrite because I, I, I criticize the model, but I love the content. <laughs> the content's phenomenal. But let's look at actually like broad strokes, what's happening with the Canadian market writ large right now. So we got the biggies, okay? We've got Chorus, who has Curious Cast. That's an, a network, and I'm using rabbit ears quotations here when I say this. We've got Rogers Media that has the Frequency Podcast Network. Now, interesting, you may not know this, but Rogers bought the largest and most successful branded podcast agency called Pacific Content for an undisclosed enormous amount of money pre-pandemic. So Rogers saw the writing on the wall in terms of that third leg of the stool, the advertiser and funding of a podcast network. As far as I'm concerned, the other players, the big players have not yet done that. Okay. So Rogers was early out of the gate with their strategy. They sunk a ton of money into buying a branded podcast network before really putting any gasoline into their forward facing network. So Rogers has frequency backed by Pacific content. If you're in Toronto, uh, as far as I've seen this on LinkedIn, I haven't been there. I'm not in Toronto. I'm in Halifax. There's a giant new billboard for their new show called In This Economy. It's on the Frequency Podcast Network. It is backed by Pacific content. That show is branded content. That show has been bought and paid for. So there is inherent money in that show. That is a very smart model. So Rogers, I think is doing it right. Okay, well, then we got CBC with their podcast, which is funded by taxpayer funding and advertisers. 
most of which is going to generate American audiences. So there's this whole other Canadian content issue there. And then to a certain extent, we have Bell Media, who I don't know if they know if they're coming or going, but they've got this whole thing with iHeart Media Network, right? Okay, so Curious Cast with Chorus, Rogers with Frequency and Pacific Content, CBC Podcast, and Bell Media with iHeart. There's a few other players, um, but those are kind of the big ones, okay? Now, what do they have? These companies all already have the audience. They have audiences of millions of people, whether it's already over the air radio, whether they're partnered with Sirius XM, which some of them are. So that would be a satellite frequency audience, um, whether they have television audiences. Most of them do with the, you know, Chorus has, has uh, their television arm, right? But they has also got a radio arm. Okay, so they're able to cross pollinate and draw from that pool of audience to grow their podcast networks. They've got it baked in. They also have baked in, as I mentioned with Rogers, an existing bank of advertisers to either upsell or downsell in some cases. So they're going out with a media package and then they're able to say, hey, we've got this other cool thing that's a podcast network. Would you like to buy that? Now, there are problems inherently with that for the sustainability and the future of podcast networks in general, when it's being sold as an upsell or a tack on, I feel when I'm doing sales that tack ons like that inherently devalue the tack on. So I think that's a problem. Nevertheless, they're able to do that because they have these huge advertisers, huge media buyers already in their back pocket. The other thing they have is they have creators on staff. I know that <laughs> they're they're releasing a lot of them and the media is in turmoil because people are losing their jobs every day. But at the end of the day, they do have a lot of creators already on salary. So we look at the big guys and we think, okay, wait a minute. There are podcast networks out there working. Yeah, but the big guys already have the three, the three key ingredients baked in. They've got the content, they've got the audience, they've got the advertisers. So how do we make the media landscape better with independent networks, right? Because that is a monopoly. And okay, but I don't think that's what we want. So let's talk about what happens at the independent level because setting up a network of podcasts for the big guys is simple and it makes it look like we have this burgeoning podcast network environment in Canada, but we don't really. We don't. The challenge for independence is far more daunting And this is why it's so hard to stand them up in Canada, let alone sustain them. Because these forces of content, audience, and advertisers are always in direct opposition. There's always a tension among those three elements that are required to do media well. So next, just just to unpack this a little more at how difficult it is at the independent level. Let's take those three ingredients, content, audience, advertisers, slash revenue, and I want to map them to what I've called the universal forces. Because those are media terms, right? Content, audience, advertisers, those are media terms. Let's map them to universal forces that we all kind of understand and can feel in our bodies, okay? To do content well, it requires creativity and commitment. It requires creativity and extreme commitment to that creativity, which you can put into a bucket, I'm going to say, is talent. You need talent to make content. Audience can be mapped to time and effort because when you're an independent, to build an audience, it takes time. It takes a long time to build an audience that is going to love you and stick with you. And for the advertisers slash revenue, what it actually requires is results. Advertisers, especially in Canada, are very, very hesitant to buy on spec. They won't spend money unless you have results. And you can't get the results unless you have the content and the audience, which requires talent, commitment, time, and effort. And this is why the independents struggle, is because those three forces are against them. So all the advertisers go up to the top to those other guys 
that we've already talked about who can just blow out the competition because they've got access to the advertisers. They've got built-in content creators and they have humongous cross-pollinated multi-omni-channel audiences already. Okay. So, and then, then the other part of this for independence, and I've noticed this in having conversations with broadcasters who have jumped from broadcasting into podcasting, people who are also trying to start podcast networks, is that that whole results piece on the advertising side really requires understanding sales strategies and sales energy and how to package a sale and how to make a sale and how to create lead gen and do prospecting. And there's a lot of hustle, hustle, like pound the pavement energy required there. And what I've heard from folks and and gleaned is that that is a huge, huge gap in terms of knowledge and experience for those who are jumping from mainstream media into the world of independent media. And it's, it's not because they can't do it. It's because it's just not taught. It's not a natural muscle for them to have developed. So all of a sudden you jump out of mainstream and you try to form an independent network And time, talent, and results is what's required. And you may have talent, but you don't have time because you're a startup. And you may have talent, but you don't have an audience. So you don't have results. So you don't have revenue. So you can't sustain yourself. Smaller companies tend to fall short on one or two of those necessary ingredients. It's just a fact. So what do we do? (laughs) <laughs> like, like Aaron, this is, this is dire. We're never going to have independent media and uh, independent podcast networks in Canada. Well, how do we build a flourishing podcast environment in Canada then, given the fact that what I've just outlined for you makes it seem like podcast networks don't really work or they can't work. And, you know, if you've been listening to me for any amount of time, you're, you know that what I'm going to say is that it's going to require out of the box thinking. It absolutely does. And that's going to help address most importantly, that revenue and results side of the equation. In the startup world, we talk a lot about this thing called collapsing time, the benefit of being able to collapse time. How can we do more in less time? Not necessarily with less resources, but in less time. And so I think going back to the drawing board on what it means to sell media and to build media companies is what's going to be required for us to cut through the noise. Where are we drawing the lines between advertising and entertainment? Where is education, which is a huge component to podcasting, where is education an actual sellable benefit that has value versus an added value or tack on to a package? These are all questions that we can be asking ourselves in order to try to jump through that revenue side of the equation. I also think it's about retraining the talent, as I I kind of alluded to. I think it's about retraining the talent in both sales and on the creative side to understand new forms of efficiencies and relationship. Because one thing that always struck me as odd when I worked in mainstream media is that half of the building, more than half of the building, I think, never truly understood how their work created a through line to revenue. And, and, you know, I get it for journalists. Absolutely. There is an ethical and objective divide between the editorial side of a media network and the sales side of a media network. There has to be. There, abs- there has to be. That's clear. But companies have never been really great at showing the newsroom itself what it was worth and how it could be worth more while still being in ethical integrity. I think it's, it's, it's possible. It's just never been done. Um, I think if we were able to do that with our new media teams, we'd see great results. If we're able to show, hey, guys, when your newsroom or your editorial team or your creative team or your content team functions this way, this is how it impacts the growth and trajectory of the business. But I got to tell you that our media folks, certainly broadcasters, they're not talked to like that. They come to me and I retrain them to work with SSN or I consult with them to start their own, um, you know, independent careers as freelancers or whatever. And the number one block they have is not understanding their value. They don't understand the value of their time, effort, work, brilliance and how it draws a direct line into the business model. 
And it's not hard to explain and it's not hard to learn, but what we can't have anymore are these teams of creators having no sense of how valuable they are to the functioning of the overall system. Because here's what happens when they do start understanding that, and my team is a perfect example, whoa, it's power. Because my entire team understands how every action they take on every show that we do actually helps us with our mission of getting more content creators onto the network, of building better, bigger audiences, of making real impact for the folks we work with. They understand it. They don't just function for a paycheck that the sales team needs to go hustle and, you know, f- fill the pie with filling, right? There is like all oars are pulling in the same direction. That's what we've got to do if we're going to break through this monopoly and actually create podcast networks that function. So if we're able to do that, I think we're going to see great results. But I don't think we're going to survive the current upheaval by maintaining these old arbitrary boundaries between you're a creator, therefore we're not going to talk to you about the value of your work beyond your salary. Now, let's talk a little bit about the content side, okay? Because how most podcast networks function right now, and this is, (laughs) I've had, uh, if, if you email me and ask me to talk about podcasts and podcast networks and stuff, I will take your call. We will have a 30 minute coffee chat, but this is what I'll tell you. Okay. Because usually it's like, I have this great idea and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to pick a random niche sports. Let's say sports. I don't sport. So I can, I can pick on sports and they say, I'm going to go get the local guy who talks about basketball. And I'm going to go get the local guy who talks about volleyball. And I'm going to go get the local guy who talks about soccer and hockey and lacrosse. And I'm going to pull them all together. And I'm going to put all their shows under the local sports network, podcast network, or whatever it's going to be. Right. And this is going to be great. And we're all going to be in the same place, in the same network. And then we're going to sell this whole thing to advertisers. And that's, that is what most people believe a podcast network needs to be. And there's nothing wrong with that because there are multiple independent podcast networks that look like that. It's an amalgam of independent creators that come together contractually to form a relational network that then is sold at scale to advertisers. And how that works on the revenue side is the network founder takes a commission on the sales. And it's usually, I mean, I've heard it can be as high as a 60-40 split, 70-30. Typical is 80-20. Okay, so the network would take 20%. um, And then the creator will get residuals. And I say residuals on purpose because usually, usually those checks are like 20 bucks or less. Okay, the residuals are not big residuals, but that's the tried and true business model. So it's akin to an affiliate model and it can work beautifully at scale. You need scale first to make that worth your time. Because what happens with this this approach of I'm just going to go out and get like-minded creators and put them all under a banner and cross sell them to advertisers and why most of these networks can't get off the ground or peter out is that at the heart of that model is relationship management. You end up actually managing relationships with dozens or in some cases hundreds of creators And then on the flip side, so you got the creators on the one side that you got to keep happy because without them, you don't have the audience. But then on the flip side, you are also managing all of those advertiser relationships that flow through you to those creators. And then on the administrative side, (laughs) you are managing often hundreds of monthly, teeny tiny monthly like payouts and the residuals. So you end up having this really complex accounting system. You become kind of like this financial go-between for small shops. And the truth of the matter is that that can bury you in relationship management and legalese if you're not careful. It can bury you, especially if you're brand new and you're a startup. The contracts need to be super, super tight because all of a sudden you're managing a relationship and In business, the way relationships are managed are through contractual agreements. So those contracts need to be so tight, explicit, 
clear in terms of things like exclusivity arrangements, preventing undercutting on sales, disclosures, first rights of refusal, what happens if they decide to leave the network, how, how is the content policed, what happens if somebody says something that goes against the mission of the network, what is the reaction and result of that? It can get messy. So, so messy. Unless you're really committed to making that model work. And that's why it always kind of makes me giggle when someone shows up and they're like, I've got this idea and this is what I'm going to do. And I'm like, okay, I think that's a phenomenal idea if you can do it. But this is what you're really getting into. You are getting into relationship management and you're going to be buried in legalese and accounting. Okay. There are very few in Canada who have been able to do this successfully. Those who have been successful have done it incredibly well. The majority get into it and they're like, oh God, I can't do this. And therefore I can't make money because without those contracts with your creators, you can't sell through to them in a way that's actually going to be fruitful financially. And I say this too, because I did look at this route uh, for SSN for a hot, hot minute back in 2021 when I was like, I think I want to network. And so I did all this research. I talked to a whole bunch of people and lawyers and accountants. Like I talked to all the people um, and, and I ended up saying like, wow, this is going to take too much time, too much energy, and we're not going to make any money. We're just like, we're not going to make any money. And then it wouldn't be fun. Not saying that money makes everything fun, but again, you need money to keep a network going. We, I need to eat. My children need to eat, right? So you may have noticed this, but the result is that Story Studio Network is a network on the outside, but we're an agency on the inside. So off the top of the show, I talked about the Frequency Podcast Network there at Rogers, backed by Pacific Content. In my research, I discovered they're the most successful model so far in Canada. They're, they're bigger than us by like 18 million fold. Not for long, <laughs> if I can put that to the universe, not for long. But that's the model that works is, a, is an agency that backs a network. So you control the flow of revenue. You also fill the content gap. You also fill the talent gap with talent that understands their role within the business model. So that's how a podcast network should work. And that's why podcast networks don't work is because they try to be all things to all people. They try all at the same time to grow in three directions, content, audience, advertisers. And you can't, you, you cannot be in three places at once. Story Studio Network doesn't sell CPMs. We don't sell average quarter hours, at least not right now. Maybe a few years down the line we will, but we don't do that because it splits our focus way too much. And I know that if we had gone that route, I just know it, that we would have been in a dog fight and we likely would not have survived. We just wouldn't have. So there you have it. We're almost ready to wrap up season one of the fourth draft. That was my longest episode to date. We're just cresting on almost 30 minutes kind of broke my own rule today, but I had a lot to say. I'm going to round out this season uh, with a little bit of a different episode. I want to talk about some of the reading I've been doing lately and the things I've learned and how I think it's going to apply to what is on the horizon for media, for podcasting, for small business uh, in 2024. And you can add some of my suggestions maybe to your holiday reading list. So that'll be the final episode for the year. And then we're going to come back next year for season two. And I'm going to start bringing in some guests to challenge maybe some of my opinions about these things. Because I'm not the be all and end all. I know there are some folks out there who think I'm full of it. And I welcome it. I'm going to bring them on the show. and We're going to debate things out. It's going to be great. Make sure you connect with me over on LinkedIn. Aaron Trafford. We're also Story Studio Network on LinkedIn. You can follow us over there. If you're following me on Instagram, 
drop me a DM. Let me know how you like the show at its.aarontrafford. If you have ideas, hello at storystudionetwork.com. And don't forget to rate and review the show over on Apple and Spotify, especially if you're holding your phone in your hand right now. Just take like two seconds and hit the little stars. Goes a long way to helping other people find the show. All right, that's it for me today. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.